We're going to finish up chapter 13 today, and we're going to talk about blocking variables, confounding variables, what happens when we add more factors, and then we'll wrap it all up. So starting with blocking, we're going to jump right into an example. In our first video, we talked about growing tomatoes using OptiGrow to determine if they were juicier and tastier. In that experiment, we used nine different plants. Suppose that the garden store that you went to to buy your tomato plants only had six. So you bought those six and then had to go down the road to another store to buy your last three. This is an issue. We have to ensure that the store will not have an effect on our experiment. Perhaps one store is better at taking care of their plants than the other. So one will produce better results than the other. So therefore, what we have to do is we have to block out that variable. So we're going to make the store that the plants came from the blocking variable. By blocking them, we are isolating the variability of the differences between the blocks. So by isolating them, we can say that we know that the store that they came from will be evenly distributed instead of only affecting one particular treatment group. So the way that we would do this is that we would randomly assign the six from the first door to each different treatment group and then randomly assign the three from the second store to each different treatment group. So that ends up giving us six treatment groups. Because each plant was only randomized within their block, this type of experiment is called a randomized block design. Here is a diagram of a similar situation. So in this case, we actually bought 12 from one store and 6 from a different store. We block this out by having block A be 12 tomato plants and block B be the 6 tomato plants. Then we would have 4 plants in each of these three groups. Again, they're randomly assigned. And then each treatment, we have the control, half dose, and full dose, and then you compare. Then we do the same thing in our second block, where we randomly assign them two plants to each group. One group gets the control, the half dose, and the full dose. And again, we compare. In retrospective or prospective studies, subjects may be paired together because they are similar in ways not under study. This is called matching. So we still use the same idea in observational studies. It's just it's a matching situation instead of a blocking situation. For example, in a retrospective study of music education in grades, so basically they're trying to see if playing a musical instrument has an effect on students' grades. We may end up matching students who play an instrument with somebody of the same sex and family income, but doesn't play an instrument. So what this does is that then when we compare the grades of music students to the grades of non-music students, it reduces variation due to gender differences or income. So again, we're kind of blocking out other variables by matching students that have common situations. Again here, blocking and matching, it's the same idea as stratifying. So now what happens when we add more factors? So we're going to stick with our tomato example here. There are two different types of gardeners those who water, and those who leave it to Mother Nature. So those who water are going to get the hose out and water their plants. Those who leave it to Mother Nature say when it rains, the plants will get water. Suppose that OptiGrow wants to make sure that their product will work for both types of gardeners. Therefore, we want to include the amount of watering to our experiment. This gives us two factors, which will end up giving us six treatment groups. The amount of fertilizer that we give is the first factor. The amount of water we give is the second factor. So we would have no water with contr a control group, no water with our half dose, and no water with our full dose. And by no water, I mean Mother Nature is going to do the watering. And then we would also have watering daily in our control group, watering daily with our half dose, and watering daily with our full dose. So those would end up being our six treatment groups. So the way that you can determine how many treatments you're going to have, you're going to take your different factors and determine how many levels of each factor you have. So we had three levels for the fertilizer and two levels for the water. So this gives us six treatment groups because three times two is six. 
For example, the following diagram shows a study of the effectiveness of different fertilizer and water combinations on the juiciness and tastiness of tomatoes. So again, we take 12 tomato plants from a garden store. We randomly assign them to six different groups, two plants in each group. So that's what we have here. We have group one, two plants, group two, two plants, group three, two plants, so on and so forth. And then we uh, have each group be a different treatment. So the first treatment is our control with no water. Ha second treatment is half dose with no water. Third, full dose, no water. Treatment group four is to control with, with watering. Treatment group five would be the half dose with watering. And then the last treatment group is to full dose with watering. And then again, you pick a uh, tomato from each group, and then you compare the juiciness and tastiness. Confounding variables. When the levels of one factor are associated with the levels of another factor, the two factors are said to be confounded. What this means is that one factor, or the levels of one factor, will affect the levels of another factor. So, for example, a psychology professor, he decided that he wanted to determine if the way he taught his students affected how they felt about the course. So he decided that in the winter semester, he was going to teach with a monotone, have very little emotion and just talk very even level, still have the same office hours, be, answer all of the same questions, give the same tests, cover the same material, everything else was the same, but he taught with a monotone. In the spring semester, he then had the same class, but taught it more animatedly, was more interactive in class. Again, teaching all the same material, same tests, same everything else. And then at the end of each semester, he gave his students evaluations to fill out. The issue here is the fact that he taught one in one semester and another in a different semester. And not that it had to happen at a different semester, but that it was a different time of year. So ending the winter semester, you're ending in December. It's cold, the daylight is short, it's snowy, it's gross. So students tend to feel a little less happy. Ending the spring semester, it's sunny, it's bright, the weather's warming up, and you're going into summer. So students tend to be a little bit happier. So the, they, their mood could affect their, how they fill out the evaluation. Therefore, those two factors are confounding because when he's teaching the class would have an effect on the evaluation as well as how he's teaching the class. So a better way to do this would be to teach the same class in the same semester. One class you teach with the monotone, the other class you teach animatedly. Then the semester won't have an effect on your results. Confounding can also occur with a poorly designed multi-factor experiment. So for example, a credit card company wants to know if people are more likely to sign up for a credit card if they have a low rate or if they have a low fee. So what this credit card company decided to do is that they mailed out to people offers to sign up for the credit card. In one offer, they gave people a low rate. In the next mailing, they offered people a high rate with a high fee. Now obviously here, more people were going to sign up for the low rate with no fee. The issue is, is that they didn't have enough treatment groups. They should have offered a low rate with a high fee and then a high rate with no fee. That would provide us with more accurate results. So is a variable lurking or is it confounding? A lurking variable creates an association between two other variables that tempts us to think that one may cause the other. This can happen in a regression analysis, so with their scatter plots, or in an observational study. A lurking variable is usually thought of as a prior cause of both y and x that makes it appear that x may be causing y. So a lurking variable is like an underlying reason. Confounding is when the experiment is not designed properly or if one factor affects the other factor. So finally, what have we learned? We can recognize sample surveys, observational studies, and randomized comparative experiments. So these methods collect data in different ways and lead us to different conclusions. So a sample survey allows us to see how a general population feels about something. An observational study allows us to analyze data 
either as it occurs or how it had occurred, and then make uh, conclusions based off of that. And a randomized comparative experiment allows us to prove cause and effect. We can also identify retrospective and prospective observational studies and understand the advantages and disadvantages of each. So the advantage of a retrospective study is that the data has already been collected for you. A disadvantage is that you had no hand in it, so if there's something wrong with the way that the data was collected, there's going to be something wrong with your conclusion. For a uh, prospective study, an advantage is that you know that as long as you're not making a mistake, your data will be accurate. A disadvantage is that it sometimes does require more work and resources. Only well-designed experiments can allow us to reach cause and effect conclusions. So only experiments. Surveys and observational studies just allow us to make generalizations, but not come to a cause and effect conclusion. In a well-designed experiment, we will manipulate levels of treatments to see if the factor we have identified produces changes in our response variable. We also know the principles of experimental design. We have to identify and control as many other sources of variability as possible. We need to try to equalize the many possible sources of variability that cannot be identified by using random assignment. We need to replicate the experiment on as many subjects as possible. And then we need to control sources of variability if we can and consider using blocking to reduce that variability. Finally, We've learned the value of having a control group and of using blinding and placebo controls. We've also recognized that problems can be posed by confounding variables in experiments and lurking variables in observational studies. That is it for tonight. I hope you guys all have a wonderful night, get some sleep, and I will see you guys tomorrow.